this is the last you'll have to hear of me. I'll try and <laughs> get through this. And I should advise board members um, that um, you've seen this. Um, and so if you want to leave now, uh, feel free. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. Where are we? So I wouldn't blame you if you looked at us and all the preaching we've been doing about metadata and thinking, wow, what a bunch of dweebs. Who can get excited about this, right? This is not cocktail conversation. Um, it seems pretty dry. Um, and, and the truth is it sounds we're like we're just mildly obsessive about getting things right. You know, it's a form of OCD maybe that we have. Um, and, and so what I'm trying to do here is actually make metadata sound uh, really interesting and exciting and possibly critical to like our epistemic future and ability to know what's true and what's not. Um, and so we'll see where we get to with this. Um, what I want to do is I want to talk about trust first. And specifically, I want to talk about a very different model of trust that exists on the web from the model of trust that exists in scholarly communication and, the acad and academia. And um, as with all you know, things like this, I think probably the first thing I should do is define what I mean by trust. Um, and I like this definition that comes from Phil Wendley, Wendley uh, which is belief in the veracity, good faith, and honesty of another party with respect to the transaction that involves some risk. Now, the critical thing here in this definition, I think, is the risk, right? Because in our case, the risks can be anything from the annoying wasted time and effort. And we all know that researchers have way, way too much to read, and they're already having trouble keeping up with it. Um, so any wasted time and effort is going to be frowned upon. Um, but also their reputations are built on the kind of content that they, uh, they publish. And if they cite something that ultimately, or base their research on something that ultimately turned out to be untrue or a problem, um, their reputation may suffer as well. And then, of course, possibly much, much more. I mean, again, I hate to bring it up because it does cause a lot of people to cringe. Um, but, you know, the, the Wakefield case. Right? There can be severe repercussions um, in, in scholarly uh, communication if we get things wrong. Um, and a long time ago, when I first started sort of um, uh, working in the scholar comms area, um, I was obsessed with this question of trust and how trust is modeled um, on the web. Um, and, and because it was, it was unclear to me how we were supposed to trust uh, information on the web, even back then. We were being inundated with spam and with, um, you know, and with, with advertisements for dodgy, you know, things out of, out of, you know, out of, um, uh, you know, countries and, you know, trying to, you know, convince you to send them money to their bank account because they were trapped and, and stuff like that. Um, and this book really, really sort of explained something to me that I hadn't got for a long time. It's a book by Kieran O'Hara called Trust from Socrates to Spin. Uh, to spin. Um, he describes trust uh, across two axes. Um, the first is local versus global, okay? So an example of local trust is that is personal, right? I know, um, you know, uh, my friend, and, um, and, and I trust them because I've had a lot of experience with them, or I know somebody in my family, and I trust them because I've had a lot of experience with them. Uh, sometimes that's transitive, but it's not deeply transitive, right? Just because I trust my friend doesn't mean that I'm automatically going to trust somebody that they trust. So there's a, a, a weak degree of transitivity there. Um, trust by proxy, on the other hand, is different. So trust by proxy is transitive. And a good example of a transitive trust or a proxy trust is an auditing firm, right? You have an organization, and their job is to go into other organizations and do an audit and their reputation and, 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 and so on and so forth depends on their doing that accurately. And therefore, if they've audited someone, the trust is transitive and you're supposed to then invest, you, you know, trust the things that have been audited. So that's a good example of proxy trust. Now the problem with personal trust is by definition, it doesn't scale, right? I only know so many people. I can't know personally every, you know, owner of every company out there 
um, in order to trust them to do the right thing uh, with their finances, right? Um, and the problem with, uh, with proxy trust is that it's got systemic risk built into it. If you lose trust in the auditor, then you're going to lose trust in everything that was audited, okay? So the second sort of uh, axis that, that Karen talks about is horizontal trust. Um, I mean, sorry, is, uh, gosh, well, I forgot this mislabeled, vertical trust. And by vertical trust, he means that it's hierarchical, right? That some, there is some way to enforce norms of behavior. Um, you can be kicked out of a club. You can be suspended, you can be fired, you can be put in jail, right? These are all forms of hierarchical trust where somebody can actually force you to do or behave in a certain way. Um, and uh, horizontal trust is trust, uh, you know, is, is trust amongst uh, 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 equals, right? So I can't coerce anybody. I can, if I go to a shop, for example, and they don't, and they don't, you know, give me good customer service, I can't force them to give me good customer service. The best I can do generally is just not go there again, right? Um, there are very little, they've got little recourse. Um, and of course, the big problem with, with, with hierarchical trust is that it's subject to abuse. And the big problem with, uh, with, with the other end of the spectrum is that it's not enforceable, again, sort of by definition. Now, if you put these two together and look at where web trust lies or internet trust, it's sort of in the bottom left-hand corner, right? We don't have internet police, generally. We're getting there, that's changing a little bit. People are trying to look at, at that. But up until now, we have not had people enforcing norms of behavior practically anywhere in the web, right? And bizarrely, even though this is a gigantic global network, we rely on a lot of local trust types of ways of assessing information. Do I recognize this person's email address, right? Um, there it's very hard for you to absolutely verify that somebody came from them, but that's generally, these are the kinds of rules. Does this URL look correct? We don't have many, many ways of actually determining these things. If you contrast this with scholarly trust, right, you have a gigantically different system. You have a system where there is a big hierarchy, where people are, you know, have to graduate from one school to another. They have to pass test after test after test. They can be sanctioned if they don't behave certain ways. They can be kicked out of the academy. They can be flunked. They can be, you know. And we have a high level, level of, of, of proxiness there, right? The, the fact that a person got a PhD at a university conveys a certain amount of trust, or at least transitively is, conveys a little bit of trust. So, We've got these two opposite ends of the spectrum as far as trust goes. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, right, is that a lot of the kinds of things that we do, that we talk about having to do with trust in, you know, in the internet, we're, we're adopting in the scholarly world, right? There are, you know, we're moving online. It's hard to tell whether a journal article is, you know, is real or whether it's fake. It's hard to, 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 to make some of these judgments. And you know, our first reaction is probably to do the po worst possible thing, right? Which is to say, ooh, well, let's, let's create a badge or a kite mark to say, trust me. But as we know, the worst way on earth to gain trust is to say, trust me. This is not a reproach that works. What we want to do is be worthy of trust. We want to be able to give people evidence that they should be able to trust us. And giving evidence is one of the key things here. Now, we all rely on brand for some aspects of conveying trust, right? And brand, if it's working, right, your brand, whether it's eLife or, or whatever, is supposed to convey things. You know, is it, is it likely to be good? Is it likely to be important? Is it likely to be relevant to the area I'm interested in? Is it likely to be sound? That's a sort of new uh, level that a lot of people are, are, are looking at. But brand is built on, 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 on a foundation, right? All of these brands are built on a foundation of other things, and we often don't think about them. Every brand started out new at some level, without a reputation. But in our world, right, 
all of these bra uh, brands um, did try and implement sort of a hidden layer of stuff that does convey trust and that does help convey some, some give, give researchers some heuristics for determining whether the content is trustworthy. Um, and by heuristics, I just want to, I want to give you sort of an example. Uh, let's play a game here. Um, what's this? What is it? Come on. It's an article. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Did you know you could do that? Did you know that you could look at a, like a blacked out thing there and determine that well, it's a scholarly article too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's scary. What's that? Yeah. Right. Cool. And what's that? Isn't that weird? I mean, how do we, you, now, I guarantee you if we went out into the street, well, actually, we're near a reference library, so it's probably not a good test. We went a few blocks away and we showed this to somebody. They wouldn't be able to do this. Do you remember learning this? No. All right. Um, what's that? All right. Now I'm going to ask a question here. What's the subject? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that kind of cool that that infrastructure, that shape is shared by academic literature regardless of what discipline it's in? That there's this commonality that we never thought of? That's kind of cool. Um, what language is it in? It could be in Spanish. It's likely that it's in English, right? Just by virtue. But, but you don't know. Again, if it were in Spanish, if it were in Portuguese, if it were in French, it would probably have this shape as well. All right, so there you go. You were right. What's that? Yeah, and we can go on. This? We're really good at this. <laughs> Isn't this? Yeah, it's kind of. All right. And you're right. And we can keep going. If I tell you that yellow is punctuation and red is a number, what's, what are you saying in yellow, red, yellow? Citations, references, yep, absolutely. What's this? You're, 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 you think I'm going to fool you, don't you? What is it? Come on. It's an article, right? So it, this even works with two columns. But here's a trick. Anybody know this article? It's fake. It was generated by a computer by a little tool at MIT that can generate fake papers and format them. So heuristics can be games, right? Um, and that's something we have to look out for, but it's hard to game them, um, particularly if you've got a lot of things to go by. Now let's compare this to the web, because the big thing we're talking about is different between tr trust on the web and trust, uh, trust in you know, the, the traditional trust we've built. What's this? Is it, is, it, is it academic? Is it a, you know, cartoon? Is it what, anybody know what website this is? No, All right. How about that? Could be academic too, it doesn't look that different, right? Certainly isn't academic. So look at this, we've stripped away all these cues online. Cues that we've all relied on without even knowing it in one way or another for a very long time. What are we going to replace them with? How are we going to change that? How are we going to provide the cues and the clues again? What is the new clue going to be? I claim that it is partly going to be metadata, right? Because remember, we get back to this business of brand, and everybody has to start off with a brand that's unknown. But what do they do? They start adopting some conventions almost immediately. They document the provenance of almost every part of the article. What is it? Where can I get it? What refers to it? What does it refer to? Citations. What's been done to it? Has it been peer reviewed? If so, how was it peer reviewed? Who provides stewardship of it? Who's responsible for correcting or updating it or retracting it? 
Who do we credit it to? Who are the authors? What affiliations do they have? Who funded it? What are their credentials? All of these things we document and we provide along with the content. If you tried to start a new journal brand and you didn't do any of these things, that would be an immediate sign that something was deeply, deeply wrong, right? So we have to do these things. We know this. And I think that what's happening increasingly, and what we're going to see happen increasingly, is that people are going to start looking and saying, if people are not doing these things, I'm going to start doubting whether that content can be trusted. This is provenance information. And I want to talk about something. This is a diagram that comes from a book by John Walensky, and, it's, and it talks about open source workflows. It's the only good workflow I could find for publishing anywhere, but a lot of it applies to whether you're, whether you're doing open access or not, um, except that there's a payment section. Um, um, well, sorry, that the payment section is at a different place, I should be clear. Um, but one of the things about this workflow is that to most researchers who are participating in this, most of it's invisible, right? They submit something, it goes into this thing, some stuff happens, and ideally it comes out. I mean, that's the ideal workflow almost from the researcher's point of view. A lot of the things that go on behind the scenes, the making sure that people have signed certain, um, that they've adhered to certain, uh, you know, rules that they've, that they've, you know, done, you know, they haven't done animal testing in some weird way, that they've protected patients' identities. All of these things are checked. All of these things are looked at. But does this information get out on the other end? Is there any way for people to find out this information? To people just looking at it, this is kind of a blank. They're not sure what's going on in here. And one of the things I think that is going to happen is people are going to have to start exposing more of this information, making it clear what publishers, what responsible publishers are doing, documenting that, and making it available in machine-readable form. So there's this article that's come out recently, and it makes a very good case for us banning the term predatory, predatory, jur predatory journals, right? Because it's a, it's a stupid phrase that conflates all sorts of different things, right? Um, it, conflate, it often is used to conflate publishers who are just starting out and don't have a reputation, publishers who are just starting out and are trying to build a reputation and aren't doing all the things yet right, um, just plain ordinary bad publishing, and then deceitful publishing, where people are actually trying to mislead people into believing that they're doing things that they are not doing, right? But if you think about it, if you can't see, right, what's gone on between submission and publication, how do you tell the one from the other? How do you tell that this publisher actually did some stuff in this other one? Is it, you know, is it that they, is it, the fact that you can't see that, is it because they did a splendid job? Or is it because they did nothing at all? Or is, or is it something in between? If you don't have that sort of provenance information, a lot of this stuff stays opaque. So this foundation is becoming more important. It's stuff that we're going to start looking for, and it's going to extend beyond the traditional bibliographic metadata that we've been considering, right? This is a quote from uh, Christine Borgman, right? Proven provenance is both more and less than metadata. It involves the origin and history of something, documentation of the chain of evidence, custody, and relationships to other entities. This is something that we use. I'll point out that when I showed you those, those, those redacted article images, almost everything that you could identify was a form of metadata. Authors, titles, section heads, references. Metadata has already become an important part and it's going to continue to be an important part of how we demonstrate that we're worthy of trust. I want to be able to go in the future. This is, you know, this is a very well-known academic journal named Boing Boing. Um, but they had this article here, and I was reading it, and, and it was kind of cool because I saw this thing, and I thought, wow, um, there's, this, uh, there's this thing called the NCRG, and they're funding all this research. I wonder, you know, do they have an open funder identifier? And yeah, sure enough, they do. And you can find all the journal articles that they have funded. And there is a surprising pattern to the conclusions that they keep coming to. And so this is just a trivial example of the kind of stuff you can do if you've got the metadata to follow the provenance. But this is the kind of thing people are going to need to do more and more as we get more and more content out there that we don't know the history of, that we, do, that we can't be sure of. As we've stripped away so many of the cues that we used to use in the analog world, 
We're going to need new cues in the digital world. And one of those cues is metadata. So this stuff that's really boring and tedious and that we've been preaching to you about, it's not just us being sort of OCD about wanting to get stuff correct. Yes, there's that. But it's about, it's about this industry maintaining its reputation for being able to produce content that has different qualities and different expectations about the trustworthiness than other forms of publications. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't run way over time. Don't all rush the stage at once. No questions? 